Welcome everybody. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the many countries on which we're meeting today and recognize their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. Um, I'm speaking to you from the lands of the Kulin Nation and I recognize that their sovereignty was never ceded. We pay our respects to First Nations elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to First Nations people joining us here today. So my name is Justine Clark and I'm very happy to uh, welcome you to the sixth Parlour Lab. Um, this is a series convened by Carly Marnane and Macarena de la Vega. So right now I'd like to hand over to Carly to kick off today's event. Hello everyone. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, my name's Carly. You probably all know me by now, but I'm a practicing architect and urban researcher at the University of Queensland in Mianjin or Brisbane, if you haven't met me yet. Um, thank you everyone for being here. We're so thrilled to have Inji and Nerida with us today to talk about climate change, city making and architecture. We all know that some of the most serious issues we face today are biodiversity loss, extreme weather events and climate breakdown, and they're not felt equally by all people. So Macarena and I wanted to bring you some diverse perspectives on how buildings, planning and construction can perpetuate or solve some of these problems. So I'm really excited to hear two really different perspectives from our speakers today that might help us create the inclusive, environmentally responsible cities that we want. The Nerida has an engineering background and a regional tropical city context and Inji from an international urban politics perspective. So our first speaker today is Dr. Inji John, a lecturer at the University of Melbourne. Uh, Inji writes that she was attracted to urban studies because of the possibility of change, making a society-wide impact and having a purpose greater than one's own life. I think that's really beautiful and it probably captures the intentions of many of us in the audience today too. Um, Inji brings us an international perspective to the topic of architecture and the environment, having been born and raised in Seoul, South Korea, obtaining a master's degree in Paris and then a PhD from the University of Washington in Seattle. She also has a book coming out in July called The Cities, Cities in the Anthropocene, New Ecology and Urban Politics. So we're really excited to hear maybe a little bit of its contents today. So welcome, Inji. Thanks for being here. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm a bit nervous. I didn't realize that there'd be so many people. So I'm a bit nervous. Um, so my topic uh, for the talk today is Cities in the Anthropocene, New Ecology in Action. Um, and this is basically based on my book that is coming out, um, sorry, uh, in July uh, from Pluto Books um, in London, uh, but you'll be able to uh, get it too. Um, so uh, this is the fire um, that I actually experienced, in, not, not me, but this is a Marimbula, New South Wales, and really kind of prompted me to, to write uh, the book um, that we actually felt the consequences of climate crisis in our city. So um, really the, the fog and everything uh, was really tangible impact that we feel uh, rather than uh, the rational argument. Um, so uh, new ecology, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the philosophical perspective. Um, so the environmentalist philosophers like Bruno Latour, Anna Ching, Donna Hare, um, they influenced by uh, Michel Serre and uh, John Dewey. Um, and uh, they talk about how to go beyond the fetishization of mother nature. Yeah. Uh, and so what they try to do is that they try to dismantle the human and nature dichotomy. Uh, so uh, the environmentalism shouldn't be something that we should do as a charity, but uh, has to be situated within sustaining our everyday life. And also it kind of uh, provokes that the top-down moral grounds don't always work because it's difficult, if not possible, to impose certain moral standards uh, from on high uh, because there are you know, people's life experiences and trajectories are radically plural and heterogeneous. And the third point is to go beyond the Kantian uh, rational communication because sometimes I uh, people are motivated to act out of the affective effects of their everyday material surroundings and they're not necessarily persuaded by the logical strength of the argument. Um, so I'm really happy that Narita is going to talk more about this today, um, but so I also visited Darwin and 
um, to kind of understand how do we talk about the environment without essentialist morality of protecting nature. Um, so I visited, uh, I kind of compare Darwin and Tulsa, and especially Tulsa, there's the dominant presence of fossil fuel industries. So people are more careful talking about um, nature as an, like an essentialist norm. Um, so they, uh, so I talk about how pro-environment initiatives can be deeply integrated into uh, everyday city living. And what I found out that is that they talk a lot about health, quality of life, extreme weather, and energy bills. Um, and they talk about the tangible feedbacks that people can, uh, can connect with the lived experiences of ordinary people. Um, Dari and I observed you know, very rich Arakan Asian culture and market culture and cyclones and uh, heat waves trees. Um, and also in Tulsa, uh, there's involvement of Cherokee Nation in electric vehicles um, and recreational fishing, trees, tornado alley, uh, greenstone water infrastructure as a way to introduce environmental topics to those who don't really disagree or you know, do, do, don't really realize the, the seriousness of the climate crisis. Um, and then I also talk about uh, how uh, green agenda can be pursued in the context where everyday poverty is more important than the longer term ecological questions. Um, so I kind of compared the cities of Cleveland and Cape Town. Um, and I found out that a lot of practitioners, they try to uh, marry these two ideals uh, by talking about local rendition of green economy and connecting green infrastructure job, uh, green infrastructure with job creation potentials. Um, so Cleveland, uh, they talk about climate conscious construction, um, HVAC uh, updating, and, and also clean energy production with offshore wind because there is a big lake uh, in Cleveland region. Um, and in Cape Town, they talk a lot about uh, utility service provision, uh, decentralized utility service provision using uh, solar panels. Um, and green tourism and attracting green tech companies and investments uh, such as geotextile, geotextile for green infrastructure or insulation windows uh, as a capacity to generate jobs for uh, non-white uh, people. Um, so we see that the sustainability is framed as a job generating ideal rather than kind of the, uh, the kind of the top down norm. So um, why do I think that cities have the capacity uh, to address a climate crisis better than other scales? Uh, is that I think cities are small enough to be graspable. So this allows people to develop shared material experiences of feedback from nature. And also cities are intensive enough to possess a degree of influence and leadership given their population size and concentrated built environments. And cities are also large enough to be complex. So being able to overview and address different interaction effects that occur across uh, different locations compared to neighborhood scale. But I, I talk more about this in my book. Um, so I think the, the main message uh, of the book uh, and also the research that I do is the complex system approach to policy and governance. Um, so as centers of intensive material movements and interaction, cities can reinstate human dependency on nature through basic infrastructure like electricity, waste, water, and sewer systems. Um, and I also kind of talk about the development of city identity or spiritual power, like you know, why we are drawn to certain cities to, to live. Um, and this cannot be explained uh, without the role of non-human agencies like water, waterways and hills, mountains and topography, et cetera, and our interaction with them. So articulating the significance of non-human surroundings in urban design and planning can convince people to rethink their dichotomized understanding of the social versus environmental. Uh, finally, uh, avoiding coercive imposition or centralized control, cultural approach uh, or narrative approach can be used to introduce pro-environment ideas and imageries, and this can be delivered through not, not only linguistic articulations, cultural narratives or political narratives, but also cities' material expression that affect people's emotions and buildings, uh, feelings such as architecture, built environment, art exhibitions, etc. Um, so these are some of the pictures uh, that I uh, have in my book. Uh, so this is um, the eastern suburbs in Cape Town, um, uh, where most of the known white population uh, reside. And this is Tulsa. Uh, this, this looks like a really beautiful park, but actually it's a stormwater 
um, proof uh, park. So uh, in, when the water comes, uh, this, this area can be flooded. And this is also Tulsa. They try to promote kind of like green imagery uh, in their region. Um, and also this is a waterfront area in Cleveland. So there was a very severe fire, severe fire in Cuyahoga River uh, during the industrialization period. So after that, they tried to revive their relationship with water uh, using kind of the cultural narratives such as um, this one, there is an art exhibition on Cuyahoga River fire and try to reestablish a uh, relationship with nature and water. And this is my hometown, Seoul. So they also um, restored the waterway uh, after the rapid economic development in the 70s. Uh, they actually covered it up during the 70s uh, to, for the economic development but, development, but after that they restored the stream to emphasize the historical relationship with uh, this waterway and uh, our, our cultural narratives. Yeah, so I want to conclude by this quote that I have in my book, uh, which is kind of the, the main uh, reason why I decided to write it, um, is if you're automatically sure that you know what reality is, uh, you're operating on your default setting, then you, like me, probably won't consider possibilities that are annoying and miserable. But if you really learn how to pay attention, then you will know that there are other options. It will actually be within your power to experience the crowded, hot, slow consumer health type of situation as not only meaningful, but at, but sacred on fire with the same force that made the stars love, fellowship and the mystical one is all things it's done. Basically kind of talks about how, um, how everyday reality can be just given to you and it's not uh, always um, what you desire, but you can activate that change uh, with people around you. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Inji. Oh my gosh, that was amazing. I love the idea of um, city identity being around non-human agencies and it always is that anyway. It's just that we often don't recognize that or, or talk about that much. So I, hopefully in the, in the chat, we can talk more about that. Um, but next I'd like to introduce Nerida. Um, Nerida Horner is an environmental engineer at CSIRO in Darwin. And she also holds a master's degree in anthropology and development, which I think is a really interesting combo. Um, Nerida is currently the coordinator of Darwin Living Lab, which aims to improve the livability, sustainability and resilience of dry tropical cities that are getting hotter and facing more extreme weather conditions. So really excited to hear from Nerida today, who will bring us a Northern Australian perspective to the topic of nature, nurture and engineering. Welcome Nerida. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thanks, Carly. Um, I'll just share my screen. Yeah, so um, my absolute pleasure to be here today and to connect with you all. Um, uh, I think as I mentioned just a moment ago to Justine, this is sort of absolutely the space we want to be in and talking to um, practitioners about um, some of the work that we're doing um, in Darwin and, and indeed that's part of our MO. Um, so I'll, I'll launch right in. Um, so Darwin is a beautiful uh, tropical city at the northernmost tip of Australia. Um, it's a city that's multicultural. It's largely aware and increasingly connected to its traditional owners, the Larrakia people. And it's also a place of boom bust economic cycles, dependent on mining and petroleum industries, tourism and government investment, and particularly in the defence um, side of things. The livability of the city is already uh, dependent um, uh, to a large extent on its climate and um, people already report that's a reason for coming or going um, and that, that's a feature in the, the human landscape as, as much as the, the broader landscape. I'm the um, project coordinator of the Darwin Living Lab and I'm here to share a bit of a story about what we're up to in Darwin with you today. So. Um, through a stakeholder ideation workshop in 2018, participants identified their vision for Darwin as a cool, thriving capital of the North. However, it's already in a humid tropical climate and the city will face further challenges into the future under a changing climate. Um, so I'll start with some of the why. So Darwin is hot and it's getting hotter. And in urban areas, um, this is exacerbated as the built form retains heat um, and it's then released into the night, which reduces the relief that you might otherwise get 
um, from the nighttime you know, in hot places. And that's known as the heat island effect. Darwin's expected to, uh, sorry, projected to experience a more than fourfold increase in extreme heat days under moderate climate projections. This obviously causes a range of negative impacts on people and the environment that are pretty well documented. Um, for example, though, um, increased hospital admission rates are associated with periods of extreme heat. And we've also seen that in even southern parts of the country with extreme heat. So the challenge, particularly for tropical areas, is, is to adapt our built form and our behaviour um, to mitigate heat risk, particularly for vulnerable groups in the population. So that's obviously a very anthropogenic focus um, uh, and to, to look at, you know, how can the city remain a, a nice and livable place for people. Um, but there's obviously, a, there's also a biodiversity uh, impact there and particularly how the two uh, integrate in the urban in environment. So through the Darwin Living Lab, we're helping um, address through uh, kind of three areas I wanted to focus on for today's talk, which was on nature, nurture and engineering. So um, first to nature. So we're looking at um, how to bring green space uh, and retain water to cool landscapes in the city. Um, and we've got a website, which I'll refer to later, but there's a, also a body of work in, the, in science, in urban ecology about how bringing those things in does have measurable impacts on um, livability. So uh, we're working to tailor those approaches to Darwin. And we're also working out ways to um, uh, demonstrate the cost benefits and the values of green infrastructure over the life cycle. And as Inji already pointed out, um, you find in the, the broader dialogues about this sort of work that people question the value of that investment and they question why. And they're certainly not looking at um, nature as sustaining life. Um, it's about what can it do for, for people in that city environment. So that's sort of the overarching discourse. Um, and so we are um, playing to that um, to try and provide the information that is necessary in the science that is necessary to inform those decisions. Um, we're also working with Larrakia people to identify landscapes and ecosystems and species of significance um, to them uh, and really as, a, as an avenue to enhance uh, and find, identify ways we can enhance some of those things around the city. And this also links to that idea of Darwin as the thriving cool capital of the North. There was also all this dialogue about people wanting to really um, uh, appreciate what's special about Darwin and not just have it look like any other city with the same plants that you might find in, in a, a Mediterranean climate city somewhere else. Um, there's also some equity considerations around green space um, that need to be considered and um, the benefit of doing all of this work is then to be able to try and compare um, this for Darwin and to so test and evaluate along, along the way. As to nurture, we're nurturing innovation. We're harnessing local knowledge and the latest science through a collaboration approach. So we've brought together um, three levels of government and the CSIRO as the founding partners and working to build um, greater partnerships and collaborations within the lab. Uh, we're two years in so far um, and a bit of info there about our funding, considering that 6.8 million is seed funding um, of which we're leveraging to try and grow our reach and impact. But essentially our, our main strategy is this nurture, is nurturing those local networks um, harnessing local knowledge and latest science. Uh, and as CSIRO, we've, we're nationally um, linked, networked as a national organisation, but also we're linked in with universities and overseas institutions and trying to bring the relevant knowledge to Darwin uh, wherever it resides. Um, so it's, it's an, a really open collaboration. Um, I, I meant to mention there too, we, we hold a, intended to hold an annual symposium. The first was in 2019 didn't have one last year and we've now got a, a webinar series. So um, yeah, we encourage people to jump on our website and sign on to some of those as um, they're every, every two months at the moment. Uh, on the engineering side of things, essentially this will be where the rubber hits the road. So changing the heat island of the city will require reshaping and reprioritising impervious surfaces. So that's car parks, um, verges if they're, if, they're not, if they're currently impervious or under vegetated, um, the building facades, the public spaces, how private land is utilised, 
um, what choices we make about roads, um, where they exist and, and where might they not um, be necessary. And so this has led us to engaging with a whole range of different um, areas like the human movement strategy for the town um, and work that people are doing on active transport and other things that are directly linked to how you use your public space and, and um, the city's roads and infrastructure. Um, uh, and urban experiments there is really like where, we, where we're now seeking to increase the impact of the work um, by influencing others. So we don't have money to build new buildings. You saw that in the budget. Um, essentially what we can do is influence with the science and the collaboration and then measure and monitor what change we're able to create. And we're already starting to see some um, really exciting ways that that's um, bearing fruit. So what we've done, these are a bit out of order, I'll just whack them all up there. Um, so we've developed uh, two years in, we've um, done some heat mapping uh, across Greater Darwin, which essentially prioritises the main areas for change um, across the city, so hotspots. We've reviewed heat mitigation methods um, from global research that are most likely to succeed in similar climates to ours. We've informed a heat mitigation strategy for the city. Um, so that's directly informed by research that we've conducted, but also brought to the attention of partners from uh, international work. Uh, and that'll set out actions for the three levels of government and the living lab and how we'll be working together. Um, that's soon to be released, it's not out yet. Uh, and we've also designed a, a Your Tropical City website, which we intend to keep up to date um, as a bit of a clearinghouse for knowledge on tropical design innovations and, and things that work and don't work um, and, and continuously update that over the remaining eight years of the life of the lab. Uh, and a few other things on the slide, I won't, won't read them all. Um, the next steps, and I guess the call to action um, for, for this group is really like, um, the, the next stages are really, what's the role of different types of materials, reflective materials, lightweight materials? How do we integrate shade and overhangs and things to maximise that cooling potential in the city? How do we rate in our cities? Um, how do we retain water in the landscape for cooling? Um, that has great potential to make a difference to urban temperatures. Um, how do we increase the footprint of the on-ground changes in priority hotspots around the city? So partnering with big landholders is something we're starting to work towards. Um, and, in, and we're also looking for private sector landowners to connect with and um, look at you know, potentially where new urban developments might go in, um, increasing the penetration of green space. Um, we're also working on a digital twin, um, which will, the green infrastructure layers will be released over the coming sort of six months and then further layers will be added to identify and track the changes over time and we intend to have a, a web interface for that um, available in the near future. Um, I just wanted to shout out to the team. I couldn't get a photo of everybody and I couldn't get all the photos in at the, the right time, but this is a, a photo of, um, from our symposium and just some of the people that we've been engaging with. But um, this is a huge team effort um, and um, particularly to uh, Kate Cranny who uh, assisted us to, to be here today. And thank you. I can happy to answer questions. That's just a bit of a bit of an intro. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to both of you. I, I should also just mention our colleague Macarena is um, in Spain and um, hasn't been able to make it. So I'm standing in for her with Carly. Um, so we've got some good questions in here straight away. Carly, do you want to go to the audience question straight away or do you want to? Yeah, let's do that. Okay. And then Sure. And then we can ask questions. I have so many questions. So let's, <laughs> let's go to the audience first. <laughs> okay. Timothy, do you want to ask your question um, about policy? Yeah, still settling into the work from home setup again. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, Narita, for your presentation. I just wanted to ask, so I work on uh, regulatory sandboxes and how we can change regulation to enable some of this innovation. And I just wanted to know what relationship your project had with local government, state government to enable some of the work you were doing. Yeah, great. Thanks for your question, Timothy. Um, that sounds really cool. Um, regulatory sandboxes. Um, sounds like we need one. Um, uh, but yes, we're, we're part, in partnership with um, the local government, so City of Darwin, the 
Territory Government, Northern Territory Government, uh, and the federal government for this project. Uh, in terms of what that's actually led to so far with changing in regulations, so we've been in a position to be um, uh, sort of a, a point of first call, if you will. Um, there have been some changes that the timing wasn't quite right, but there's a, a building better policy, uh, sorry, guidelines that's been developed by the Northern Territory Government. And we had a role in, in being able to provide content ahead of that development. So that was really exciting to be asked. We were also in our first sort of six months of operation. So, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to see our involvement, um, you know, be better targeted and in the future with that. Um, so regulatory change, I think um, the Section J discussion is still happening here, which makes us feel like we're in a bit of the dark ages, unfortunately, because people are still debating whether, you know, uh, was it 2016 regulation should or shouldn't be implemented here and it's 2021. So we've, you know, we've, there's still a long way to go. Um, uh, and so, I, but we, we are seeing a real, um, there is a shift in uh, how, we're seeing a more, um, seems like a more, uh, what's the word? Sorry, I've lost my words, but it seems more likely that those kinds of changes are coming. Um, and the, the benefit of working with those three levels of government is that sometimes the, the policy change or the regulation change is, is harder, um, but we've got this way of softly starting with the thin end of the wedge, if you will. And so, um, you know, Territory government and um, the, those three levels of government are extremely interested in modifying their own footprint, building footprints, um, to absorb more of these initiatives and innovations as a, a sort of leader. So to be able to demonstrate some of the impacts and benefits to others. So I think that can be quite a powerful. Um, we hope that'll be quite a powerful leading edge of of a change that. If they're making those changes themselves ahead of the policy change, then it'll be easier to get those policy changes through. But um, sounds like we should talk because, um, yeah, obviously, if we could um, get more of this taken up into policy, then we would expect that to accelerate change. Yeah, thank you. That's a, it's really great to hear. That would love to chat more about that because it's an interesting area to think about how we speed that up. Mm. Policy change can be quite slow sometimes, can't it? And regulation's even slower. Inji, have you got any um, anything to add in relation to sort of using regulation to help create change? Uh, well, I guess, um, yeah, uh, like, like you said, Justine, it's difficult in certain areas to come to a consensus. So, um, and the life experience, especially in Tulsa, you know, a lot of people historically made a living through oil industry. So it's difficult for them. They take it personally when they talk about nature, uh, when people talk about nature. So um, I think it's a slow process and it's not always easy and straightforward to push through certain uh, regulatory um, changes. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think it depends, you know, uh, some people want more assertive approach. Um, some people uh, want to influence little by little um, and there's always political debates around that. Yeah. Yeah. And keying into, into that sort of desire to be seen as leaders in the field is also can be quite an effective strategy. Um, yeah, that's true. Actually in Tosa, there is um, a lot of like innovative uh, they, they use the word <laughs> innovation a lot. Yeah. Um, and so they are developing a technology to produce waste better. Um, and so they always frame it as, uh, as you know, the number one Oklahoma thing going on in Tulsa um, as a way to um, introduce some of the topics that are not really um, uh, a natural norm for, for a lot of people. Kelly, do you want to? Yeah, I think we have another question from the audience from Marty. Yeah. If you'd Marty. like to. Uh, yes, look, I just I just wrote that because I was very conscious that they pretty well changed the dwelling um, design of, of um, private dwellings in Darwin after the cyclone and they uh, ditched the idea of houses on stilts, which was a very effective means of um, cooling houses. Uh, in the night air, uh, circulating it under the floor, and then the adoption of concrete slab. Um, 
you know, it's it's a big problem everywhere. People love concrete, but they just don't realise the long-term impacts of concrete. Mm. It does create definitely uh, a, a giant heat island and a giant problem for everyone down the track. Mm. And when you consider, like, carbon intensi- intensity as well, um, there's an issue. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Yeah, well, thanks for your question. Um, it, it is a really big one uh, because it also tends to drive other related resource flows in a city, um, so energy and energy efficiency. And um, so there's a couple of angles in which that one needs to be um, considered. And so two areas that we're looking at are um, that the CSIRO um, owns the, the software that sits behind the Accurate um, system. Uh, and so it's it's been proposed as a potential project to look at how that module deals with um, more tropical design. Um, that's it's not it's not up as a project yet under the lab. So um, we've got we've got six current projects. I sort of didn't give you the whole like you, you can find that stuff on our website if you're interested. But um, it's not one of the current projects, but it's certainly been slated for future years to to look at how it responds to tropical design and to see, because unfortunately something like that can drive things in that direction, in the wrong direction. Um, and so, yeah, so that's that's one area. Um, the other one is that there's um, this idea about trying to promote tropical design. So we've got, um, we've got an advisory group and we've um, pulled at least two well-known um, des- uh, architects um, and lands or landscape architects and an architect onto our advisory group, uh, and so that's another way to get that influence. And we have seen it's been exciting over the last 12 or 18 months to see that um, even some of the planning approvals um, for a, a couple of large buildings have had some of those tropical climate appropriate words added to the public documents around the planning approvals. So there does seem to be a real energy and um, effort uh, and cohesion in at least the that outward facing um, direction for the city and the city deal has been really widely promoted and there's you know activation initiatives as well and you can actually see quite a bit of stuff happening on the ground the built form stuff obviously takes a little longer because it's much longer planning time horizons um, but yeah we're hoping we're hoping to have um, through a few of those means have some um, some involvement in helping those things move forward. I think that's a really interesting question also about identity and um, like, what people associate with that place. Yeah. Did that come up for you, Inji, in your research, the importance of that, the image of these buildings being responsive to place and climate? Yeah, uh, I think, uh, again, in Tulsa, I think uh, when I met with some of the designers and architects, uh, they talk about the their market or the, the audience that they try to address now, they are younger generation. Um, and so they want more of that place-based, uh, like a unique character rather than the, the, like the same, you know, corporate manufactured uh, buildings everywhere or kind of, you know, younger generation don't really want to own like big houses or lands. They, you know, tend to stay near the city. Maybe it could change because of COVID, but um, <laughs> yeah. So I think the, the consumer chain, a consumer and market and all this kind of uh, audience uh, is also evolving. So um, uh, there's also a good aspect of a new uh, circulation of new population. Um, uh, was interesting because I think Tulsa tried to move away from the, the, the oil capital. So uh, they tried to attract artists and cultural uh, narratives. Um, and in a way that like uh, how young families and generations are coming in uh, and they're, uh, yeah, so that was really interesting. And was that what, um, who was leading that change? Well, I don't know. I think to be honest, the money was, you know, the, the area has the money because of the oil industry, right? So um, there are a lot of philanthropists there um, and they sponsor artists to, to come. Um, so I think the demography is changing. Um, the, the racial dy- dynamics are changing because you know more diverse population coming in. Um, and so I think that's, 
yeah, so that's why I think I kind of struggled, like, you know, this is like oil money, but um, it kind of contributes to uh, the, the shifting realities that are happening there and how it's attracting uh, new people who want to do uh, new stuff. You know, there's, there's like a young professional network uh, in Tulsa uh, where they talk about like sustainability, uh, business practices, uh, etc. So it's very little and small, but, but um, I think it's kind of a culture movement that comes with the younger population. Right. Excellent. Um, I think we might, if we can go to Alex Lawler now, um, JPE will come back to you. Um, but Alex, would you like to put your question about the size of cities? Yeah, thanks, Justine. Um, and thank you very much to the speakers. It's been amazing. I, I love the Darwin Living Lab. It just sounds like such a great initiative. My question, though, is for Inji, you, in the introduction to your um, your talk, you talked about the um, the role of cities, particularly in um, in jurisdictions where there's little or no kind of national policy um, setting. Um, you mentioned that cities were um, small enough to kind of do it go do it themselves that the governance, there was an aspect around the governance that you talked about, and then you talked about them being large enough to make an impact. I've got a, I've got a sort of a two-part question. Could you just expand a bit on that governance bit um, that you talked about? And secondly, when is a city too big to, to you know, too big to make it work or, or not work? Yeah, that's a great question, but it's, um, it's, it's going to be a very long answer, so I try to be brief. But so there is an entire chapter in my book that talk about what, what is a complex... Excellent system. product placement. If yeah. you can't answer the question, go by the book. No, 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 but I want to answer the question. Um, so basically what I mean by complex governance um, is to talk about the, um, uh, the flow of different materials. So, you know, we can focus on uh, the, the water, electricity, um, and this kind of the everyday stuff that are kind of concentrated in the human settlement area, which is cities. Um, so um, that aspect and the other aspect uh, is to have the diverse populations. So um, cities usually attract diverse uh, people. Uh, and so the practitioners tend to develop a very um, subtle approach sometimes, try to get to different kinds of audiences. So they develop kind of a cultural or political narratives, kind of the articulations that they make um, in trying to reaching out to the, the divergent audiences. Um, and whether it's a whether it's a big is a problem or small is a problem. I mean, I, I wasn't uh, really trying to be specific about uh, the, the size or the physical at aspect. The, the physical aspect is relevant when we talk about sharing the, the same experiences. So if I'm in Melbourne and you know, I if there is going to be a the cyclone or things like that, we all have uh, empirical uh, experience and memory together uh, with inhabitants. Um, but also to the point of the divergent population was the key thing because um, I think it's important that we consider different perspectives and life experiences uh, rather than uh, rushing from the top. And do you, I wonder, I mean, Alex's question about scale, do you think Darwin is actually, partly you can be successful because Darwin is, it's kind of small enough and big enough that you can yeah. pull all these people together. I was I used to live in Wellington. I always used to think you could get so much de happening there because it was big enough, but it wasn't too big. Mm. Right, right. Make all sorts of relationships work. Mm. They were kind of harder for facilitation. Though. I don't know. Yeah, I think I, I kind of focus on that diversity, you know, um, because in Darwin there are many, uh, the, the diversity was really astounding, which is really yeah. good. Um, and, um, I guess if I compare a, a city with a small town where I imagine the, the, the horizon of the world is quite narrower uh, because you see same village people everywhere. I think Darwin has a dead village feeling, which was really yeah. cool, the markets and everything. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, there is uh, this diversity because there, there are uh, migrant 
um, population. So when I mean what I mean by city is probably like you know that the, the people uh, concentration of people basically um, and not necessarily the physical size of it. The mm. cosmopolitanism of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But these days yeah. we, we say that it's di diasporic uh, community yeah. because cosmopolitan is that like, you neoliberal and etc. So. Oh, is it? <laughs> okay. Ooh. That's a lesson learned. <laughs> Remember that yes. next time. Which word was neoliberal? Cosmopolitan. Oh, oh, yeah. okay. Um, I think there's kind of the um, interaction between policy and policy change and regulatory change, which I think we all sort of put a lot of hope in and for potential to change. And what practitioners can do on the ground is a very, you know, it's that, that kind of intersection of how policy and um, and practice might come together. Um, so I thought we might go to JPE quickly for their question about um, retrofitting and um, both policy and initiatives to support that um, and what and where practitioners might sit in that. So JPE. Thanks, Justine. Hey. Hello. It's, hi, <laughs> it's Jo and Pete here um, in Adelaide. Um, yeah, really fantastic discussion. And I think across both presentations, it just shows the sort of scalable nature of what we're all hoping to achieve and how quickly it really needs to happen. Um, but I love um, Narada's um, presentation around just the really collecting the data on the ground to really demonstrate to the politicians and to influence policy. Um, I guess you know, one of the key issues is, um, yes, building new buildings, but with the existing stock that we have in our cities, um, big or small cities, now, are there some examples, I suppose, of how we can be showing how retrofitting could um, be a really good way forward um, at the same time as, as, as building new identifiable buildings? Could some retrofitting actually re-identify uh, buildings, increase shade, um, those sorts of things? And um, is that happening in Darwin? Centre walls. Mm. Yeah. Um... So yeah, I think um, wholeheartedly, yes, um, that that's important because um, you know you won't be turning over all of your building stock uh, in the time frames necessary to to respond. Um, so I think um, in terms of examples from Darwin of retrofitting that we've recorded and and researched yet, not yet, um, it is certainly something that's been proposed. Um, so certainly from some of my former work in uh, water and energy efficiency, like retrofitting has a really strong business case for doing that. Um, and um, particularly if, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> if building owners are themselves paying the bill. So there's some perverse incentives sometimes around um, who owns the building stock versus who gets the, the direct economic benefit of making those changes. And I suspect we will find something similar with retrofitting buildings. <clears throat> Excuse me, part of the reason that we are looking at the, the digital twin for the city is to try and upscale. So if a building changes its facade, it doesn't just benefit the building occupants, though if they added more, <clears throat> excuse me, they added more, um, you know, shading that covers over walkways and covers over their windows, they might get a reduction in their energy bill, but they may also uh, improve the, um, as not just the aesthetics, but the temperature for people wandering by, or they might help reduce the nighttime heat island around that building if it's large enough. And at the moment, there's not a really easy way to evaluate those sort of co-benefits, if you will, um, and that they they are given to someone else. Um, and so we're hoping, or the, not we're hoping, that the aim with the digital twin work is to be able to demonstrate sort of at scale what those kinds of benefits could look like. Um, and um, I, I'm aware from, again, from a water and efficiency space um, that incentivising retrofitting in that space has led to massive changes over really small, or really short periods of time. And I guess you could just look at solar, rooftop solar rebates as, as one example of how that sort of policy lever can be pulled. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think that's probably a, the most I can answer that one at the moment. 
based on research we've done here um, and that we're aware of. But if others in this group are aware of good examples of where retrofitting does show those sorts of benefits that, that I may not be across or because others in the team aren't here, they can't say, um, then I'd be really keen to follow up with people afterwards and, and get some of those suggestions. Yeah, we'll type them in the chat box too. That's a great suggestion, Nerida. Um, Inji, did in your um, travels and, and chats, did you come across any um, examples of retrofitting or I guess other um, examples of how practitioners have started to respond to climate change or disasters where there's kind of no government action or not any policy change kind of taking place? Yeah, so uh, I think I have two examples. So one example was in Cleveland. Uh, so they are trying to like introduce job creation potentials of green economy. So they talk about HVAC uh, that, you know, hit um, HVAC. And, yeah, so heat and I, I don't know, the, the building structure for uh, uh, is it air conditioning and yeah, uh, yeah, etc. cetera. So, um, or uh, the insulation windows um, or things like that. Uh, so kind of climate conscious HVAC uh, uh, retrofitting uh, is, uh, has the job creation potentials for uh, labor intensive jobs. Uh, so they talk about that in Cleveland sustainability uh, strategy. Uh, so they actually like, you know, lay out the potential salary uh, for this kind of jobs. And the other example was in Tulsa, where they talk about the liability causes, right? So for disasters, um, architects try to introduce these uh, certain designs to clients, uh, not necessarily because of nature, but because, you know, uh, it's the liability, liability clause and we have to include this um, if you want to be insured for this, etc. cetera. So uh, that was interesting. Um, and they think that they are responsible for talking about this because they don't want to be sued later. Uh, and yeah, so that was interesting. Um, my next question is to both of you. I don't know who, um, which one want, wants to go first, but it's about the relationship between human and non-human, which you both talked about from a really different perspective, um, kind of on, I guess, this relationship on city identity and place. So um, often, I guess, nature and the built environment or even humans and nature are considered two kind of separate things. Um, and I'm really interested to hear your perspectives on how the built environment or how practitioners should think about this or, or deal with this in their individual projects and um, how an individual pro project might, might speak to that broader city identity um, and the relationship between the human and non-human. Um, who should I ask first? Maybe Nerida. <laughs> you talked a little bit about biodiversity and, and that mm -hmm. people are wanting to come to Darwin and, and experience this tropical place. So, um, I guess, how does that work from a from an individual point of view as well? Mm. Yeah, well, it was something that came out really strongly in those early ideation workshops um, before sort of pre-starting the Darwin Living Lab, getting it off the ground. And then in our symposium as well, people kept identifying. So we had some workshop sessions at our 2019 symposium and it was a constant factor that people wanted to, they did want to see the city um, become more green, cool, the words they attributed to that, you know, lush, all those kinds of things. In fact, the city is a, a dry tropical climate. And so eight months of the year, we have no rainfall. And so the kinds of things people are associating, not always, but sometimes with, so particularly the word lush, because it's, it's, you know, the, the native vegetation is not usually lush. Um, in terms of really green and glossy and um, and so we we have kind of explored that a little bit that that what we need for a climate appropriate development in Darwin or, or redevelopment retrofit the city it has to be things that are more akin to the native species that are here and to embrace that and celebrate that and so I think native um, gardens as a part of or green space as a part of um, uh, buildings and retrofits and redevelopments, but it it can also go into so into, I'm look, thinking really at the the practical end of it. Um, what it'll look like is we're working on so the work we're doing with Larakia here to identify biodiversity that's important to them. We'll go into tree species lists 
that the City of Darwin will then have on their website to describe the kinds of species that are ideal for whatever growing condition. So we want to filter those through or push those back through the ways that those levels of government already talk to the public um, because they do have a role, a strong role to play in setting um, the tone or the message for others. Um, and so that project specifically is also engaging with friends of the botanic gardens, um, uh, row gainers, you know, groups around the city that utilise green space already to try and tap into, you know, some of that local understanding of what makes um, the nature of the city, as well as we're looking at studies of the biodiversity of the city to see what's been tracked and recorded um, before. Yeah. yeah. That's really Could interesting too. That that, yeah, but it's so interesting that what is coming up about what people want is this lush city, but that's actually not really appropriate mm -hmm. for that place. And so I guess it's on all of us to educate ourselves about what is appropriate in, in that place yeah. and actually start designing with that in mind. And I would say not entirely. So, you know, seasonally, yes, yeah. in the post, post wet season, the place comes alive and it's you know, when you look at tropical savannas, you get these bright green shock of um, sort of ferns and, and um, things more at sort of ground level or shoulder height. Um, and, and so getting those, that sort of species back into the urban environment um, could be a way to do that. And also the thing is that there is some recognition that some of the spaces people want, like a grassed play area, you know, there really isn't a... Um, uh, an analogous, there may not be an analogous species for grass. And so we might need to continue, you know, we still want to have sporting ovals and we still want to have. So I think the, the recognition that there'll be compromises, um, it's just that the, the pendulum could probably swing a lot more towards um, whatever other native species. And then that has benefits for water sensitive urban design, um, benefits for biodiversity, um, et cetera. Etc. Place, identity. Yeah. Yes. And Inji, did you um, have anything to add about that relationship between human and non-human on city identity and place? Yeah. So basically, going back to uh, what I mentioned on the the affective powers of the the surrounding environment and landscape. So uh, sometimes people are persuaded by uh, their everyday surroundings and landscape uh, rather than a rational argument about uh, the the facts. Um, some people are persuaded by it, some people are not. Um, so um, the, using the affective uh, powers like a kind of incurring emotions or uh, the way people perceive space um, can be influenced by good design. Um, and the other point about uh, the indigenous species was also you know, present in Tulsa where uh, we say that the gardening uh, in general, we idealize certain kind of English garden, et cetera, but they are not indigenous species um, in America or, or Cape Town. So they talk about how these invasive uh, foreign species are kind of, you know, draining a lot of water. Mm -hmm. um, and so they talk about the, they, they kind of try to make the indigenous species more beautiful. So kind of indigenous flowers and um, uh, all these kind of things that we think that, oh, it's like a street flower. But actually, these are indigenous species uh, adequate, and, and we can make it cool, and we can make it beautiful. Uh, and so, people's perception around which flowers are more beautiful or not uh, was interesting. Yeah, that's so interesting. Changing, we can actually change people's perspectives of what is beautiful through our design inspirations. That's yeah, fantastic. Aesthetic. Aesthetic. Yeah, yeah. And I will add one more thing there that there have been, and this probably harks to the the retrofit question as well from JPE is that. Um, there are parts of the public areas of the city that are being tarmac being ripped up and plants being put in and they're using it as also a way to connect sort of economic development for small businesses like you know a bit of the trop tropical version of a laneways type strategy in, in Darwin um, and that's been really interesting to see um, because there is there is more there seeming to be more native plantings um, in those spaces and people are flocking to those areas businesses are reporting you know higher revenues and people are out enjoying those spaces so um you know there's so many feedback loops here between the people the economics the biodiversity and and then the broader benefits which we're hoping to um, get better metrics around that's fantastic 
So we've got like two minutes left. Um, so if I could ask you if you could each wrap up with a key takeaway from your research for the practitioners in the audience. It's a tough ask, but if it, just one minute each, um, maybe Narada first and then Inji. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think um, a, a key message would be around the collaboration. Um, so to really try and bring in, there's heaps of available knowledge, I think, in these areas and that these messy intersections between traditional disciplines and by collaborating um, with others through networks like this and reaching out in your city. And I would include non-traditional um, uh, make that collaboration broad, not, not just in sort of the, the areas of practice. And a particular one is around plant knowledge, Indigenous knowledge, um, making that collaboration a lot broader. Are there yeah. any other labs in other cities? Like yeah, there are. There are. So um, there's, they're quite nascent. So Darwin's the most developed. Mm -hmm. They've been um, sort of work in place for Western Sydney and for um, Gin and Dara in Canberra um, mm. for some time, but they're slightly, they're, again, they're different models. So um, Western Sydney is um, uh, tied up with the Celestino Aerotropolis. Um, so the, the Western Sydney airport development, mm. there's a big chunk of land there, but CSIRO is assisting with some of the planning about a, um, uh, like a water waste energy efficient mm. development city. Um, so it's a satellite city. So they're tied up in a lot of planning for that. Yeah, cool. Um, and then the other one is Gin and Dare in Canberra, which is actually the sale, attached to the sale of a piece of Syro land that was mm -hmm. an ag and food, was an urban farm or a peri-urban farm. Um, and so they're working on a, a sale, but with um, a, attached to it, uh, that they're, uh, they're looking for a specific um, developer that has values that are aligned to this idea of a, um, a, a, a development that will include in looking at the environmental resources, the biodiversity. There's a lot of ecology work that's been done on that site. So we're looking for an aligned developer that will embrace. Mm. Um, mm. But that's a, that's a Brownfields site. Mm. Um, whereas this is a city that's already, and the, you know, the Western Sydney one is a city in planning as well. So mm, interesting. Mm. So da the Darwin actually, one, oh, sorry. Sorry. I was going to say, it's actually, it's that sort of whole question about retrofitting, but it's the city, right? It's yeah. a retrofit city. Yeah. So it's funny someone brought that up because um, in the early days we were calling the Darwin, the retrofit, the yeah. retrofit living lab um, internally, but we hadn't really, we hadn't gone out there. Um Cool. Yeah, that's interesting. Thanks, Narada. Inji? Yeah, I think I will continue what Narada has been said about this place-based practice, because sometimes we think that the nature is too abstract or environment is abstract, but um, when we talk about in terms of our everyday landscape, uh, it is very situated. So mm -hmm. we have to think about place-based practices and building collections uh, with uh, interhuman communication uh, and, and not to think too much. I mean, we have to think about like big conceptual questions, but also about our, our interhuman solidarity and place-based practice. Awesome. What a fantastic message to end on. Thank you so much, Nerida and Inji. Um, if you'd like to get involved with the Parlor Lab series, anyone in the audience or our speakers, um, please let us know. Or if you have any feedback, please always get in touch. We're more than happy to welcome anyone on the team or if you'd like to co-host or if you'd like to share your research, um, do let us know. Thank you so much to the University of Queensland and Sahans for supporting Parlour Lab and of course to all of Parlour's partners for your support of our activities and events and thank you to everyone in the audience for joining us today and of course Nerida and Inji and Justine. And thank, thank you, you everyone. Carly, for making it happen. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Good little clap for our speakers. Bye. Yes, thank you.